Hello. Okay, there we go. How y'all doing today? For those who don't know, my name is Alan. Um, I'm new here at Family Church, and um, today I got asked to read um, Acts chapter 14. So yeah. Please bear with me. Um, some of my pronunciation may not be the greatest. So yeah. So uh, now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews steered up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against their brothers. So they remained for as long, wait, sorry. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of the grace, of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided, some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country and there they continued to preach the gospel. Now in Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking and Paul looking intently, well, intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And with the crowd saw what Paul had done. They lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to save us. Oh, sorry, this, sorry. The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called uh, Zeus and Paul. Uh, Hermes because he was the chief speaker and the priest of Zeus who, whose temple was at the entrance of the city brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when he, but when the apostles uh, Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore the garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, men, why are, there, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature, Oops, sorry, of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to live to a living to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and faithful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came to Antioch 
in Iconium and having persuaded the crowd, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas and Debris, or Debris, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in their faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, which prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord, in whom, in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pam and when they had spoken the word in Persia they went down to Atalia and from there they sailed to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, and they remained no little time with the disciples. Thank you, Alan. Can you grab this, Elijah? So uh, I, I picked I picked on Alan today. Uh, I, I did give Alan a heads up. I didn't give uh, Nick a heads up last week. So I'm trying to get better, you know. And uh, and so we uh, we want to have people in our congregation help read scripture for us because as family church we value the word of God. And here's a real quick. Uh, Y'all know how you have a life hack, you know, some easy way around it. Here's the easy way to pronounce words in the Bible. No one knows how they're pronounced. So you just kind of go with confidence and, uh, and just say it like you think you say it and the next person will say it differently and it's going to all be good. My name is Dean. I'm the pastor here at Family Church. We're so grateful you're here with us on this Memorial Day weekend. Wouldn't you rather be in church than on a beach? I mean, look, come on now. Come on, you know. So uh, we're grateful that uh, y'all are here. Hopefully you light up the grill sometime this weekend or tomorrow if you haven't already, and uh, I feel the Lord speaking to me. Hmm. Might have, to, might have to go to Rouse's. But, uh, you know, so uh, we're grateful for this time where we remember one of the one of the cities we're going to talk about today, which is Lystra, was actually a Roman soldier retirement community. Helps us think about Memorial Day. We remember those in our own country who've lost their lives on the battlefield. I don't know, has anybody known anybody that died in war? I mean, I, I did. I had a couple of friends because I was graduating high school when 9-11 happened, and so a couple of my friends went off to Iraq, and uh, um, remember my friend Joey didn't make it back. I had a couple of guys I played football with that didn't make it back, and we're so grateful for everyone who served, and uh, also those who didn't lose their lives but are here with us today who served in the Army or the Navy, Coast Guard, Marines. Am I missing one? Air Force. There we go. So thank you all. No, uh, no Space Force? Nobody? Not yet? Okay. Y'all know that's another one. So uh, I guess they got to change. You remember you used to sing the songs, like the song Semper Paratus, all those, you know, anchors away. Does the Space Force have a song yet? 
It's the Jetsons theme? Is that what you said? Okay, yeah. So uh, today's, uh, today's sermon is entitled Tough. And the big idea is that the movement begins in tough places. Just like that was a tough passage of scripture to read, Alan, the movement begins in tough places. Now we are halfway through the book of Acts. And I was talking with the staff earlier this week. We're halfway through the book of Acts, 20 weeks into 14 chapters. And guess what? We have about 10 or 12 weeks left, which means we're going to go through the last half pretty quick. I'm so excited. I'm going to give you the three main points here to open up and then talk about those a little bit more. Tough places require longevity. Tough places require life. And tough places require leadership. So if the movement begins in tough places, tough places will require longevity. Tough places will require life. And tough places will require leadership. Now, in church history, there are several great theologians. We had Martin Luther. We had John Calvin. Uh, of, of late, Charles Spurgeon. Um, I'm drawn to one of the more recent theologians, Rocky Balboa, um, when he said, that's a joke. You should laugh. It's a cheesy joke. Uh, he said in, one, in, in his movie, Rocky Balboa, let me tell you something you don't already know. The world is not all sunshines and rainbows. It's very mean and nasty place. And I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, and nobody is going to hit hard, as hard as life. But it ain't hard about how hard you can hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward, that's how winning is done. Life is tough. Life is tough. You may not be uh, silly enough to get in a boxing ring, uh, but uh, life is tough. You're going you're gonna to get hit. You're going to have to keep going. And that's what's happening here with the apostles on their first missionary journey. Abby Oye sp spoke last week about Pisidian Antioch, where, uh, where Paul preaches uh, a sermon and then is immediately rejected. And so then they move on to Iconium. And so what we see in Iconium is that tough places require longevity. This part of the world, Iconium and Lystra and Derbe, these are not easy places. These are not places that have a ton of Jews in them. You remember their, the missionary strategy to, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. But what we see is at Iconium, there is a synagogue, and so Paul repeats his pattern. He enters the synagogue, and it says a great number of bold Jews and Greeks believed, following the Romans 1.16 pattern, to the Jew first and to the Greek also. But what we see here is that after they believe, they begin to, those who oppose them, begin to stir up and in their minds. This literally means for them to cause others to think evil about these men who were bringing the good news to bad places. And so what we see is in verse 3, and this is where we get our supporting point that tough places require longevity. So they remained there for a long time, speaking boldly of the Lord. Let's go back to the end of chapter 14. What does it say in the last two verses of chapter, of chapter I mean 13? It says, but they shook the dust off their feet against them and went and... And went to Iconium, and the disciples filled, were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And so, what we see is that sometimes the apostles shake the dust off their feet and move on to the next place that's going to be open and receptive. But what we see here is that this particular opportunity gave them an gave them a, a time to endure and suffer with those who were receiving the word of God. Tough places are tough. Sometimes we like to go to the places that are easy. There's not people that are lining up to plant churches in New Orleans, believe it or not. Like, they're not. Like, it's it's a very tough place. We Once one older pastor here in the city said that New Orleans is the graveyard for new churches. And so uh, we are no longer going to be the city that care for God, but through God's spirit working like he did in Antioch, we can be the city that cares for God. And 
so what we see is that uh, they remained and they continued to spoke boldly, speak boldly. And we see in verse 4, the people of the city were divided. They became more and more polarized. Does that not reflect the world that we're in? Like people are divided. It's becoming more and more polar, polarized. But it says that the apostles stayed. And, and the apostles specifically, we have always heard the apostles referring to the 12 disciples or the 11, 11 remaining apostles and then Matthias who replaced Judas. But here this term specifically is referring to Paul and Barnabas. Paul would refer to himself as an apostle even in some of his letters that we read later on in scripture. The word apostle literally means one who is sent. One who is sent. And, and apostles, they, they, they bring the good news. They are delegates and emissaries helping to establish new works. And that's what Paul and Barnabas are doing here. And to establish this work in Iconium and then in Lystra, it took time. It took longevity. It took investment. And that's what we're going to do, Family Church. We are going to we're going to do what Kenneth Gangle says is the New Testament standard. Rejected disciples proclaiming a rejected Lord is the New Testament way. Remember, it's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. That's not in Scripture. That's in a movie. But it's a good, good lesson for all of us to know and learn. Secondly, so tough places require longevity. In verses 8 through 21, we see that tough places require life. If, there, if there's deadness, there's no life to be channeled. That's why you see in the New Testament, you see miracles and things working. And the miracles were being done to show who Jesus was, to show that he was who he said he was. And also the, the, the good news that they were heralding, the good news went to places that were bad. And so miracles just pointed back to Jesus. We shouldn't seek miracles for miracles sake. We seek miracles so that people can know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So there's no synagogue in Lystra. So they go from Iconium, which is kind of the big city in the middle of a rural area, and then they find themselves in Lystra, which is kind of backwoods. It's kind of like moving from uh, New Orleans, the East Bank, to the West Bank, right? Like, we're going to use that as backwards. People are just weird, you know what I mean? Like, it's totally different. And so, in Lystra, and let, no offense if you live on the West Bank, it's just a joke. Um, in Lystra, uh, we see people who are backwards. We see that they start speaking, and they even ascribe to Barnabas and Paul that they're Zeus and Hermes. But Paul and Barnabas don't respond to this right away, because they're speaking in their native Lyconian dialect. They don't even know the words that they are speaking. These are, y'all know, you know how it is. How many of y'all go down the, have been down to the by, down the bayou near Morgan City, Thibodeau, all that Pierre Park? You, you don't understand what they're saying. You know what I'm saying. How many, uh, Anna grew up in Bogalusa. Can you understand half the people up in Bogalusa? I can't, you know, like, you know what I mean. So you can smell Bogalusa. You can't understand Bogalusa half the time. Y'all know what I mean. So, like, here's the thing. They're in this place that is abnormal to them. But they knew life had to be channeled in this place. So Paul looks at this man who was crippled. Kind of mirrors Peter's miracle at the temple in Acts chapter 3 of raising the crippled man. He looks at him and immediately he sees some faith in him. He says, stand, the man stands, he springs up, I love it says he sprang up and began to walk. Possibly this man was similar to the man in Acts chapter 3. Maybe he was near, he, he was in the marketplace, and uh, well, the guy in Acts 3 was near the temple, but maybe he's in the marketplace begging for alms or begging for, for help. Um, that, that is not just a, something that sprung up in Kenner, you know, and this year. That is something that has always happened, the needy crying out for help. And as he's crying out for help, Paul, like Peter, sees what this man needs. This man needs life. And so he immediately springs up and he goes. And, and what they do is they see Paul and Barnabas, these men, and they see this healing that took place. And the healing took place so that this man could have life. And they immediately begin to worship them as false gods. 
See, it's our human nature that we want to deify people other than Jesus. This is why we worship uh, maybe someone who's in the White House. This is why we worship uh, athletes. This is why we, we ascribe worship to many different people. It's no different than back then. What we see is they call Barnabas Zeus, probably because Barnabas at this time was still, see, still seemed to be the leader of the group. And then they called Paul Hermes. And if you don't know anything, Zeus is the head god in Greek mythology. Hermes was the god of speech, the god who invented speech. Now, he, he didn't invent speech, but he's the false god that they ascribed that invented speech. So Barnabas was like the head. Paul was the mouthpiece. And so here, there's this ancient legend of, of back in that day, just to understand how this happened a little bit more clearly, there was this ancient legend of Zeus and Hermes coming down to earth in human form. And then they went and they uh, looked for help. They looked for food. No one, was, no one would help them except for this old couple, this elderly couple that gave their meal to Zeus and Hermes. So Zeus and Hermes blessed them by building them a temple, right? This is what we all long for from God, right? We seek God in a pagan way. We want to help so that we get things, right? And that's what they were told. If you help the gods, you get things. But those who didn't help the gods were inundated by severe flood. Perhaps the Lystrans were trying to avoid the same mistake. So they cry out and worship to their false gods. I mean, it's, it's human desire to want to be able to touch and see deity. And so they see these men and they ascribe to them that they're gods and and these men continue, and they don't quite understand it at first. But then they see that the priests, the priests of the Temple of Zeus, which was not that far outside the city, began to get uh, sacrifices ready and began to get garland ready. And they're going to throw this big party, like, in honor of them, but worshiping them as gods. And so... Paul and Barnabas catch on to this, and what does it say? Let's read verse 15 of chapter 14. It says, men, why do you do these things? We are also men of like nature with you. They're realizing what's going on. Now get this, this sermon right here is the first sermon in the book of Acts to a purely pagan group of people. Up to this point, there have been some Jews, there have been some uh, Hellenists, there have been some people who knew who Yahweh was, but this is a purely pagan group of individuals. Men, why are you doing these things? We're also men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn away from these vain things to a living God. That's who we worship. We worship the living God, not a, not a dead God. Y'all know Jesus, the reason Christianity is different than every other religion is because we can find the tomb of every other supposed religious figure who has ever walked the face of the earth. Has ever walked the face of the earth. We can't find Jesus' body. We debate over whether his tomb is maybe in a couple of places, right? And the promised land, but we can't find his body. He tells them, he says, turn to the God, turn from these vain things to the living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. He's quoting here Psalm chapter 146, verse 6. I'll go back to verse 5. It says, Blessed is tho are those whose help is found in the God of Jacob, whose help is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. You see, what separates Yahweh uh, 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 apart from every other supposed God is he is creator. We are creation. We have to understand that order. In order in, in, to follow God, we have to understand that he is a living, creating God and that we are his creation. But then he says in verse 16, in past generations, he allowed the nations to walk in their own way. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. 
and even with these words, they were scarcely restrained from offering sacrifices to them. So Paul is saying, don't worship us as gods. There is only one true living God. Paul will write about this later on in Romans chapter 1. I'm going to skip around verses 18 through 27. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, un all the ungodliness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Do you all know the glory of God has been revealed to everybody on planet earth? But we've suppressed the truth. We've suppressed the truth through our own sinful nature. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that he has made so they are without excuse. None of us have an excuse. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all turned to vain idols. And it says in Romans chapter 1, it says, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. And served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave, uh, gave them up to their dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts. We can go all the way back to Sodom and Gomorrah and see this happening. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving the due penalty of their error. And since they did not fit, see fit to acknowledge God, he gave them up to their debased minds to do what ought not to be done. God doesn't cause sin. We live in a broken world. Our world is broken sexually. Our world is broken financially. Our world is broken relationally. And we can look around at sins and we can point out and we can try to weigh one against another, right? But what we're told in the Old Testament is to watch how you weigh things. We've got to weigh everything evenly. Sin is sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But what God calls us to do is when we follow him, we begin to recapture his image. It means we, live, we leave behind our own passions and desires. People will say, well, hey, I've been born a certain way. I'd say, yes, you have been born a certain way. We're all born with sin. We are. It doesn't mean that you're a demonic loser. What it does mean is that you have a living God and Savior who loved the world so much that he gave his only son on the cross. And whoever believes in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. And you don't have to be perfect today. God's a loving God. He's not like, I've used this example before, like when you're learning how to walk, he doesn't laugh at you and spit at you and raise signs at you and say, you're going to hell when you fall, right? What does he do? He gets you up. He says, keep coming after me. It's like the old chorus in the 80s. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, right? Look full in his wonderful face. In the things of earth, they grow strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. Tough places require life. But then we see in verse 19, these people respond and they try. They, they've seen life. They've seen healing. They've seen the word. They've heard the words of truth. And because of that, they reject that. And they try to take Paul's own life. It says they stoned him and drug him out of the city. Next time we get someone telling us, no, they don't want to come to church, read about Paul getting stoned and drug outside of a city. And you know what? We can endure the persecution that we have. But Paul was left for dead. They thought he was dead. We, 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 we don't think he was dead because Luke indicates they thought he was dead. If you don't know anything about stoning in this time, I know we say it all the time, but it was, it was severe. Stoning was brutal. It was blunt force trauma. Bones were broken, internal organs were damaged. Often the skull was crushed or permanently disfigured. 
Y'all know that we think of Paul and we, we picture and we, uh, even when you're, even when I was a kid and we had those little felt boards. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? You ever grow up in church, you have the little felt boards, you know? You put the, like, Paul was always this good looking dude, right? But Paul was probably disfigured from this point on if he had not been already through different persecutions. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 23 through 28. He said, I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Five, five times, now Paul is like bragging here about his persecution a little bit. He's saying five times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. That's kind of what he was, that's what he was talking about here. Three times I was shipwrecked. He doesn't mention that he was bitten by a viper. We'll get, we'll get to that later on in the book of Acts. Night and day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardships through many sleepless nights, and hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without excuse, and apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me and my anxiety for all the churches. You see, pastors care for the flock that God has made them shepherds or overseers of. So not only was Paul's torment uh, physical, his torment was also spiritual, that he couldn't be there with those whom he loved so dearly. He says in Galatians 6, verse 17, the book of Galatians, they're in the region of Galatia. And likely after he finishes this missionary journey, as he's approaching the Jerusalem Council in the next chapter, he writes the book of Galatians, likely around this time. It's debated, but that's the first of his letters that he writes is to, to the Galatian church. As he comes near the end of that book, he writes in verse chapter 6, verse 17, and he reminds them, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. When you're persecuted, when you bring life to darkness and darkness turns against you, y'all know darkness is darkness because there is no light and darkness hurts. Y'all, we live in a dark city. Last week, you know, Natasha, I, I hadn't heard about the young boy, but y'all know about the young boy who got hit in the apartment complex? This road right here, like right down into the road, a young boy's life was taken this last week. By a, by a rogue driver who drove right into their apartment. Georgetown, a street over. A couple of young boys who wanted to kill a certain person of a certain race because of the pain and hurt that are in their hearts found a man repairing a, a mailbox and shot him dead. Yeah, we had a I mean, who steals from a church, right? We've had trailers stolen. That's why when people say, you upset about that? I'm like, man, there could be so many other things I'm upset about, right? Things can be replaced. Life, life lasts eternally. And life lasts eternally in light or in darkness, right? And that's why it's so important that we look to redeem and restore through the power of Jesus the broken world that we live in. We all remember several years ago during the summer and Black Lives Matter, right? Y'all remember that movement? And people, it got so politicized and all this. But here's the root of the movement is people are hurting. It doesn't care what the political, what's the solution. People are hurting. When Hurricane Ida came and slammed through, people are hurting. When Hurricane, what was the what was the hurricane that hit Florida? I forget the one that hit. We we lose track. We have so many of them. But y'all remember we took up a collection for a hurricane that slammed a touristy retirement area, and you would think, well, they don't need as much as we need. But hurt is hurt. You know what I mean? And hurt, whether it's red, brown, yellow, black, white, male, female, rich, poor. Hurt is hurt, and hurt gives us an opportunity to show Jesus and to show life. So tough places require longevity. Tough places require life. And here's our last one. Tough places require leadership. 
I can just see, man, I'm excited that Nick and Alan read the last two. I just see future, like, they look like pastors when they're up here. It's awesome. I'm not saying that. I'm joking. I'm joking. So, but I just get excited about the, the men and women God has put in our church. Because in order for churches to thrive and to go where they need to be, we have to have good leaders. And we have to have good leadership. That's why we see in verse 21, let's look at the end of verse 21. It says, and when they had gone to Derbe, the next city, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, the thing about Derbe is it's the farthern eastern tip of the Roman Empire in that day. It's the farthest east that the Roman Empire went in Asia Minor. And now that was the perfect place because Derbe is not that far from Antioch, Syrian Antioch, not Pisidian Antioch, the, the, the mother church Antioch. It's not that far. But what do Paul and Barnabas do? They don't take the easy way. They go back. They go back to strengthen the churches. Let's read about that. Let's read what they do. It says, and when they, verse, uh, let's see, verse 22 they turned back, strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying that through many tribulations you must enter the kingdom of God. It says, and when they had appointed elders in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they believed. And then what we see is they journey back to Antioch. And when they get to Antioch, they gather everyone together and they say about this incredible news that Jesus, he, the, the gospel has now now been received by the Gentiles, has been received by the pagans. And this will create another conflict that we'll get to next week in the Jerusalem Council where Jews, God's chosen people, are still stubborn to this point, not seeing what God had promised all along to Abraham, that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And now all the nations of the earth were truly blessed, right? Acts 1.8, you receive my spirit, right? You be my witnesses. And the spirit that they were going to receive would be power, would be dynamos, dynamite. Like, that's where we get the word dynamite for. You would receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you would be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. They are now stretching to the othermost parts of the earth. And when they went there, those places required leadership. Leadership. So they encouraged them. They strengthened them. And the way that they ultimately did this was by leaving them with good leaders. Now, what does elder mean? Well, elder is a word that's synonymous with pastor or overseer in the scripture. Alexander Strzok, in his book, Biblical Eldership, says that godly leaders, elders, lead the church teach and preach the word, protect the church from false teachers, exhort and admonish the saints in sound doctrine, visit the sick and pray, judge doctrinal issues, and ultimately shepherd, oversee, lead, and care for the people of God. We all have a part to play in the church, but God raises up leaders in the church. Y'all know if family church is going to spread so that we can reach the uttermost parts of our city and the uttermost parts of our world, it's got to be more than Dean, Abiyoye, and Elijah. You know, God is going to raise up leaders. God, and, and this is what this is what was was told in the scriptures. Second Timothy, two verse two. And what you've heard from me, Paul writes to Timothy, in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to faithful men who will teach others as well. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, we see the requirements for godly leaders in the local church. And strong leadership is needed to establish churches. But once strong leadership has been established, we all play a part. That's why as family church, we are elder-led, servant-led, right? We are elder-served, elder-led, deacon-served, and member responding or member affirming. We do things together. It doesn't mean that we all have the same role. We all have different roles, right? Men, husbands and wives, we have different roles, but we work together. We all have different, your arm has a different role than your leg, right? 
Your butt definitely has a different role than your mouth, right? Even though some of us, it's the same at times, right? <laughs> Everything has a different role, and we have all different roles to play in the body of Christ. And I don't think it's by accident that Paul finished their first, Paul and Barnabas finished their first missionary journey by paying attention to the churches that they had established. Rather than going the quickest way home, y'all get this, they went back to the places that tried to kill them. They took the tough place. It's not about how hard you can hit, right? It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. They went back to strengthen the churches. And they strengthened the churches by establishing through leaders a family, a living organism. And that's what I want to invite you today as we close. If this was important to Paul and Barnabas and ultimately Jesus who gave his life for the church... The church is not something just to be consumed online. The church is not a matter of personal preference. Hate to break it to you. You're never going to find a preacher that you can't find faults in. I, I've rewatched my sermons. I'm like, wow, that was, you shouldn't have said it that way. You know, like I'm my own worst critic. You're never going to find the perfect, perfect preacher. You're never going to find the perfect building to meet in, right? We have a second floor sanctuary. We take the upper room seriously, right? You're never going to find the church is about people who are different than you. You're never going to find a church where you like everybody. You know what? I'm your pastor. I hate to admit it. I'm sure I don't like all of you. I hate to break it to you. Like, I'm a human being, you know? But I'm call we, we love people we don't like. Abiyoye, be honest. Be honest. Do you, do you like Joke all the time? <laughs> Joke, do you like being around your husband all the time? Okay, they said yes. Maybe they're lying. But you know what I mean? Like, you don't have to like all the time to love all the time. Okay, I should pick, I should pick the, the elders in the back, back row. You know, they've been more honest. You know what I mean? You have to like someone all the time to love someone all the time. That's why Paul and Barnabas risked their own lives to go back and make sure churches were healthy as they went home. So here's what we're going to do as we respond today. I want to invite you to join the family. If you don't have a church home, there's no pressure. You don't have to make family church your church home today. If you have a church home that you have a problem with and you've been visiting another church because you don't like what they did, you got to pray. Maybe God wants you to go back and reconcile what was happening wrong at that place and go back and be a part of your church family. But if you're here today and you don't have a church family, first I want to invite you to Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13 that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call upon Jesus. What does it take to be a member of family church? Follow Jesus. Commit to him that you have repented of your sins and that you want to follow him with all your life. And then what you do is you respond with baptism. You're immersed in water to symbolize that you are, no long, that you are dead in sin and you are alive now in Jesus. You're dead to sin and you are now alive in Jesus Christ. And then the last part is just commit to be a part of a church family. And so as we close today, Elijah and Abiyoye are going to be in the back. And we have some membership commitment forms and we have uh, just general information forms about the church. If you'd like to make Family Church your home today, first we need to make sure you know Jesus. So please go and talk to them. We'd love to lead you to Jesus. We'd like to talk with you about baptism if you haven't been baptized. And then lastly, we'll just give you a, a membership commitment and kind of talk through it one-on-one. -on -one. You don't have to commit today. It could be something you bring home. Be like, man, they're making me sign my life away. No, we're not doing that. You know, you're just committing, right? When you write a check, young people, y'all remember what checks are? Do y'all know what those are? Okay, yeah. So, like, when you write a check, you sign it. Actually, you know what? Even when you use your, your credit card, right, you get the receipt and you sign it. It just means that you're committing that you have the funds to pay what you're saying you're going to pay. And that's all we do as a family. We just commit. 
It doesn't mean that we're perfect. It means that we're going to fail repeatedly over and over and over, but we're just committed to one another. That's what Jesus calls us to do as a church. And you know what? It flies in the face of a have it your way culture. You know, we have BK, have it your way. You know what I mean? Like we have a culture. It's, that's why I don't sing, y'all. Like it's, you know, it's, we're, all, we're an individualistic culture. Pete, I'll use you as a sermon analogy next week. It's going to be awesome. So <laughs> we have an individualistic culture, and that's not what God has called us to as the body of Christ. God has called us to commit to one another, to bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill and proclaim, right, the law of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that the movement began in tough places. And Lord, maybe that tough place is not a geographical region. Maybe that tough place is me. Maybe that tough place is someone in this room today. Lord, help our hardened hearts to be broken down so that we can be washed with the water of your word, so that we can hear you, so that we can commit to you, so that we can be filled with your very presence. Lord, today, if there's someone here that wants to know more about our church family, I pray they take that step to, to find out what does it mean to be a part of family church. Lord, if there's someone here today who maybe that sounds foreign to them and they just need to meet you, God, I pray in this moment they would commit their lives to you. Lord, help us to respond with what you're calling us to do. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.